Heavenly Father, thank you for delivering us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you that his work on the cross has set us free from sin and death. And we walk in that freedom today, or we desire to. We don't always live up to all that you have purchased for us, but I pray that we will live into it. And so I bless you today. I thank you for all of your people. Um, and this family, this local uh, expression of Christ that meets here at Home Church, may we grow in faithfulness to you, and in love of one another. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, before I, I really begin, um, I want to just mention that last week, uh, Amy Fife spoke about a kingdom of honor. And I want to kind of take off from where she left off in that regard, or at least speak a few minutes to that before I move on to, to my topic today. And she shared uh, about some of the hurts that come from cultures where honor is lacking because those leading have not experienced it themselves in a truly healing and, and freeing way. However gifted or intelligent leaders may be, their life experience involved their own hurt and pain, which remains unhealed. Um, I believe it was Robert Mulholland who said something to the effect that every leader brings their unresolved baggage into their leadership. And that's true. A culture of honor and healing may not have been modeled for, for you, for, for us, not internalized, not put into practice within whatever systems we were in, be it family, business, church, or other church, uh, organization or, or institution. We're all broken in some way, and we don't know what we don't know. We do what we do until we learn a better way. And we can consider ourselves mature believers and still have gross blind spots that keep us from recognizing where we fall short. And so I want to honor Amy in her message last Sunday, and if you missed it, you can still watch it online. And uh, so just a very quick recap, because I want to speak to this. Is she spoke of a, a, a worship team exodus that happened a decade and a half ago, or I don't know, when, when, when uh, oh, I have to be careful how I say this, when, when Amy was much younger. <laughs> uh, she spoke of, and, and I agree that it wasn't handled well by leadership, she spoke of two worship teams, the, the new young adult team um, and, and then the established, more mature team. And changes were made in both teams and, and not really handled well. Uh, there was much unnecessary offense and communication was poor or in some cases completely lacking, which left much confusion and hurt. And I'm not going to try to explain that now after all these years, after all, many of you maybe weren't here during that time. So I will say that much later, uh, the home church staff and elders came to terms with the, the hurt that was caused and made resolution to reach out as the Lord gave opportunity and, and seek to restore relationships as, as that's what we're called to do in Christ. And there has been much, uh, some, some real beautiful examples of God's grace, healing, and reconciliation. And just to provide another example, uh, the, the worship thing wasn't the only thing. Um, another example where honor was lacking in our leadership is exemplified by one of the typical complaints uh, that came from our elders, and that went something like this. Um, you know, the elders would come to church on Sunday morning and, and an announcement would be made about some decision um, about the, the church, and then after the service, the, uh, the elders' friends would ask, did, did you know about this? And they would say, no, this is the first time learning of it, right? And, and so it was personally embarrassing for them because 
their elders, they, they should have been involved in the discussion or at least known about it. Uh, now, I will say that before he retired, Pastor Mike initiated a process which involved uh, bylaw changes, um, limiting the future ability for unilateral control and decision-making by whomever would be the in the senior pastor role in uh, years coming, um, and by, that by increasing involvement of the eldership in all decision-making processes. And so our leadership has continued to elevate the value of honoring one another by instituting the principles of elder plurality in shared decision-making and oversight. Amy said, a culture of honor sees the heart of the Lord and the God-given value of a person and calls it into being. And I, I think that is a powerful statement and truth. If we could all learn that, we could change a lot of lives. Larry Crabb, in his book, Connecting, writes, when the gospel enables us to believe that something terrific is alive in another, and that something terrifically alive in us could actually touch it, good things happen. I'm going to read that again a little bit later, because I, I think there's powerful truth in that. He goes on to say, we accept people for who they are. We grieve over every failure to live out their true identity. And no matter what happens, we continue to believe in what they could become without demanding that it happen on our timetable or for our sakes, or that we play a big part in making it happen. But often, people seek their own honor rather than honoring others. A few years ago, um, uh, probably seven or eight, uh, after Pastor Hector came on as, as senior pastor, um, we did a, a staff uh, outing. We went to a leadership conference. Was that the Orange Conference? I don't know why they called it Orange. Um, and anyway, a pastor there spoke about styles of leadership. And he was addressing a mindset that was fairly common in, in some churches, um, one style of leadership that was responsible for much wounding within the church was that of the idea of the chosen one, the anointed leader who operated as an authoritarian. So that was a thing, and maybe it still is a thing. We certainly recognize it in, in cults, but to some extent th that was happening within the, the more traditional uh, churches. And it pulls too much from the Old Testament kings in the manner of King David, chosen and anointed by God. I've heard some Christians even use the phrase, don't touch God's anointed, referring to some, you know, pastor who has gained a lot of notoriety and, and uh, uh, you know, leads some of the, the, the influential churches. And I just want to say, no pastor today should ever be afforded that level of unilateral control or blind trust under the pretense of biblical authority or spiritual anointing. There has to be accountability within leadership. And you all have the right and the responsibility to question anything you don't understand or agree with. Now, in the end, it still may be what it is, and then you have to decide, what do I want to do with that? So I want to go back and lead, read Larry Crabb's quote one more time. Because I think this idea has powerful implications about our ability to make a difference in people's lives. When the gospel enables us to believe that something terrific is alive in another, and that something terrifically alive in us could actually touch it. Good things happen. We have the ability to make a difference in people's lives, not just because of our intelligence or our influence, but because 
God has placed something divine that is terrifically alive in us. And that's what people need to encounter. And if you can believe that there is something terrific, terrifically alive and inherently good that God has placed in them, but it's hidden, it's, it's down deep, and it, it needs to be drawn out. And that's like that quote that Amy gave, right? We're, we're drawing out the goodness, the identity that God has placed in a person. So do you have any difficult or frustrating people in your life? So, yeah, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> of course you do. We all do. And, and God may have placed them there. Um, and, you know, we all say this when we're, when we're preaching. Somehow God, you know, twists something in, in our lives when we're preparing a sermon and so, yeah, this week I, I had, um, you know, some things that were going on that, that I had to wrestle with. Um, but I've said before uh, that I've heard many times that love is not an emotion, it's a, it's a commitment. And there's certainly truth about this, it, about the necessity of commitment concerning love. In my own life, I've learned that when I look at it as merely a commitment, devoid of emotion, I can excuse myself from even trying to have genuine affection for the difficult person. I begin to feel like a martyr. I can give up hope of being able to actually enjoy the person, of taking delight in them. Can you imagine that we can take delight even in the difficult person? I find myself merely tolerating them and begrudgingly, air quotes, you know, loving and serving them. Sorry for the air quotes. <laughs> but I also sense the Spirit of God within me convicting and calling me to do more than put up with them. Love is such a big, encompassing word. And we should not limit its meaning because of our difficulty in feeling or expressing it in its fullness. I can't help thinking that when love is fully formed in us, it will blossom into a genuine affection even for the difficult person. It may include us experiencing pain, grief, and suffering but it will also include an affection and genuine longing that is willing to join them in their struggle with a hope and faith that maybe they don't have at this time. So Larry Crabbe, in, in connecting, he speaks about how our efforts to help people within our Christian communities fall short because of the inability to relate to people on a soul level. The problem beneath our struggles is a disconnected soul. And we must do something more than exhort people to do what is right and then hold them accountable. And here he says, he's speaking of groups, and by, by groups, uh, that can be any groups, could be churches, leadership teams, families, small groups, but I, I think I can even expand it, uh, this quote, uh, to include individuals, because I think we all have to kind of own it. So I'm going to say, people tend to emphasize accountability when they don't know how to relate. Better behavior through exhortation isn't the solution. Rather than fixing psyches or scolding sinners, we must provide nourishment for the disconnected soul that only a community of connected people can offer. So, and that's what we are or aspire to be, is a connected community that is, is safe. So this calls for us all to grow emotionally, to develop an emotional IQ. Um, it's difficult because it requires us to acknowledge what is broken in us before we try to help what is broken in another. Jesus said it this way. Remove the plank from your eye before trying to remove the speck from someone else's eye. So this week, um, in cooperation with uh, 
Coalition Alleviating Poverty, that's a local organization, um, and the Cadillac Winchester Neighborhood Association, our neighbors right over here, um, we began hosting a class here at the home church for our neighbors in the Cadillac Winchester area. Finney Abraham from uh, Westgate Church is the one who founded um, Coalition Alleviating Poverty. And, and through various contacts with the community and, and with others, leaders, um, he coordinated this class using a contact from our own Lily Huerta, who attends here, um, and she's supporting the class. So in response to express needs in the neighborhood regarding violence, and when I say violence, it's, you know, gang violence is, is a huge problem over there, but it's not just gang violence. There's domestic violence. And it's a testament to our effort and patience in building relations that they have come forward and shared that need. Because that's, that's a really sensitive need. Not everybody wants to, you know, voice that. And so um, we're hosting this class, and it's called Nonviolent Communication. And uh, you might think it has primarily to do with physical violence, but it does not. Any communication which involves elevated voices, derogatory language, sarcasm, coercion, manipulation or attempts to control is considered a form of violence to the people involved. And if you think I'm overstating the issue, let's consider what Jesus said. In Matthew 5, 21 and 22, Jesus speaks regarding anger. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Those are strong words. And so, to be honest, this includes pretty much all of us at one time or another. I'm pretty sure we've all lost our temper at one time or another and said things that we regretted. There's no shame in admitting that we all fall short and need help with controlling our emotions and our words when we're having difficulty communicating with others. So, just to continue a little more with Larry Crabb, the most powerful thing we can do to help someone change is to offer them a rich taste of God's incredible goodness in the new covenant. And I really want you to, to listen to this. There, I, I think there's at least one or two people here who need to hear this. He looks at us with eyes of delight, with eyes that see goodness beneath the mess, with a heart that beats wildly with excitement over who we are and who we will become. And sometimes he exposes what we are convinced would make him turn away with disgust in order to amaze us with his grace. That is connecting. And when we connect like that, it can change people's lives. Okay, so I'm going to turn now for a few minutes. We're going to talk about the freedom that comes to us by the Spirit and what that means for us and for our relationships. So the title of the sermon is The Spirit of Freedom. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So we're free from sin, and we are free from the law of sin and death. This should not only change us, but change the way we relate to one another. Not driven by our flesh to sin, nor driven by our compulsions to control others. 
2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The greatest gift we have received by, is the Spirit of God living inside of us. Each believer has the same Spirit. We have not fully learned to live by the Spirit or, and to walk in the freedom provided by the Spirit. The best thing we can do for one another is to model true freedom and provide gracious invitations to experience that freedom from a place of humility and honor. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again, submit again to a yoke of slavery. And he's speaking in the context of, of law versus faith. And the situation there was that some Jewish followers believe that Jesus, I'm sorry, that Gentiles should be circumcised in obedience to the Old Testament law. They sought to impose that requirement on new Gentile believers. Paul vehemently opposed them for the sake of the Gentile believers so that they would put their faith only in Christ and not in their inheritance, adherence to the law. Um, earlier in his letter to the Galatians, Paul explains the purpose of of the law. Paul begins chapter 3 by saying, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing the, of faith? Hearing with faith. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And so notice that Paul is referring to reliance on the law as being a work of the flesh a fall backwards into slavery. And so let's look at Paul's explanation of the purpose of the law. In Galatians 3, two chapters earlier, he writes, But the Scripture has confined us, everyone, under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now the word... Uh, Confined is a strong word. Um, other translators have uh, expressed it as held captive or even imprisoned. So it is a strong word. So confined by the scriptures. He goes on to say, but before faith came, we were kept in custody. And so you get the idea of being in custody or behind, behind bars, right? Something that's preventing you from being out, um, really meant in, in terms of protecting you, protecting us. So, but before faith came, we're kept in custody under the law, being confined for the faith that was to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our guardian to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. Um, other versions have translated guardian as tutor. So what Paul is putting forward here is the idea of a small child under a guardian. A small child is not yet capable of knowing what to do by themselves. They need a parent or, or guardian to guide and teach them. But the goal of parenting is to raise a, ch uh, raise a child that knows what to do without being told. So the King James Version, or New King, King James Version, which many of us older folks were raised on, translated guardian as schoolmaster. And I get the image of the old stern teacher who could sometimes be harsh. Uh, when you stepped out of line, they would wrap your knuckles, you know, with a, with a ruler. Paul goes on, but now faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian, for you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ. So, the problem, as I see it, is some of us still like the security of having a guardian because we don't want the responsibility of being a spiritual adult. Ouch. Ouch. We feel safer having someone tell us what to do than owning the responsibility of doing the hard work of discerning 
before God what is right and good and true. But that's the responsibility. That's the freedom that he's called us to. Or, perhaps, some of us like the feeling of control of being the schoolmaster, so we get to tell others what to do. Which, according to Paul, is choosing to use the law to enslave others. Double ouch. How many of us are guilty of trying to control or manipulate others with our words? So Paul continues this line of thought in Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this verse says don't use your newfound freedom in Christ to serve uh, serve your flesh or to continue in sin. But in the, in the context of Amy's message about honor, whenever we seek to impose our will upon others, we are, in effect, trying to rob their God-given freedom and hindering the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why in many of the Apostle Paul's letters, he appeals to the reason and consciences of believers rather than dictating what they must do. When you or I push our agenda, our opinions, our dogma on others, when we seek to manipulate them through guilt or shame to serve our set of ideals or purposes or to control their behavior, we are sinning against them and usurping the role of the Holy Spirit. In Christ, we should nurture the spirit of freedom bestowed on us by our Lord. Each believer has the Spirit within them. If we want them to grow up in maturity in Christ, then we will encourage them to walk in the Spirit and enable them to choose for themselves what is right and good, rather than telling them what they must do and taking away their precious gift of choice. And and so just to clarify, I want to do this especially for the fearful legalists, I do not mean that everyone gets to choose what is right in their own eyes like it says in the book of Judges. That's not what I'm teaching. I mean discerning what is right before our Lord and our Father in heaven in the intimacy of deep relationship. So I, did, I do a bit of informal counseling and often um, people have asked me what they should do in a given situation. And I usually respond by directing them to the scriptures and encourage them to listen to the Spirit for themselves. And I want, to take, I want them to take ownership for their decisions as they seek to follow Christ. I tell the, if I tell them what to do, then I'm binding them to myself instead of to Christ. And I won't take away their holy gift of choice. I will not subvert their responsibility to Christ and the Holy Spirit. This is how we grow mature believers who know how to follow Christ, to listen to the Holy Spirit, and to own their choices as free citizens and children of the kingdom of God. And and I just want to say too often I have listened to wounded Christians who merely obeyed their leaders. We talk about obedience. And obedience to God is good and right. But when we carry that too much into the the realms of men, there's too much opportunity for hurt and pain. So they listen to their own leaders instead of owning the decisions for themselves. They did not fully understand the responsibility or weigh the consequences of simply obeying a leader. And later, they were filled with resentment against those very leaders and ashamed because of their own immature acquiescence and blind trust placed in those leaders. And so in our discipleship of others, if exhortation, accountability, discipline, and obedience, which are all good things, are the only tools in our toolbox 
then we're missing the most powerful resource, which is the power provided by the Holy Spirit when we learn to listen and live by the Spirit. When we teach others to walk in freedom and to choose for themselves to do what is good and right, we enable them to grow to maturity under the discipleship of Jesus rather than them relying on us to tell them what, how to live. And so what is freedom? We know from the writings of Paul that, and the other apostles, it's not freedom to continue sinning. And so what is it? This question, the question, leaves it open to a certain amount of interpretation, and, and that's part of the problem. Humans then want to impose our interpretations on it, which then opens the door for us to impose our interpretations on others. So we interpret freedom to mean things like freedom to do what is right and good and holy. Okay, that's good. Well, then who gets to determine what is right and good? And holy, who 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 owns that definition, and then you know gets to tell other people what it means. And it's my conviction that freedom in the spirit is not about rules at all, or what someone says is the right thing. It's about relationship with God in the Holy Spirit, relationship between an individual and their Creator, and that is sacred. So it's not my job or your job to interpret and tell others what to do in a given situation. Our job is to point them to Jesus and the Scriptures and then allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them. God will teach them and lead them in the way they should go. So I usually offer these criteria when, when guiding others through challenging um, times and, and difficult decisions. Will what you choose be in line with the law of the spirit of life rather than the law of sin and death? Will what you choose draw you closer in your relationship with God and or others? Will what you choose enable you to live with your conscience and consequences? Every decision has a consequence. What's your long-term ability to live with what you decide? And if you really think that through, it's going to guide that decision. Some, sometimes we want to take the quick, easy answer that alleviates pain or tension right now, but will leave us in, in more trauma and turmoil later. Whereas if we do the hard thing, which often is what God is calling us to do, we think of the eternal consequences. What's it going to be like when, when we enter the kingdom, you know, heaven, and we're faced with these brothers or these sisters that we had the conflict with now? Right? So what will enable you to live with your conscience and your long-term consequences? So Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And so God himself will be our teacher. And he is also able to teach those we love and serve in a spirit of freedom and grace. The Apostle John affirms this in 1 John 2.27. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, about everything, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And so as we model and teach a lifestyle of abiding in Jesus, we assist the Spirit of Jesus living inside of others to help them respond to his gracious invitations as we walk in freedom and love. Having been redeemed and set free from our sins by his blood, we are no longer under the law. Having been adopted as children of God, 
we have become a royal priesthood, co-heirs with King Jesus. And then Peter writes, live as people who are free. Not using your freedom in a, as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. In other words, don't, dis, 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 don't disrespect those in authority. And so, do you think that the apostles agreed with the emperor and the ruling Roman government? No, of course not. Peter did not say agree. He said, give honor. Don't disrespect anyone. And so as you can see, the scriptures have a lot to say about freedom, as it does about honor. So let us walk in freedom, honoring God by giving proper honor to all those made in his image. This is the life of the kingdom, bringing the kingdom of God down into our lives, into our circumstances, our relationships, our families, and our institutions. Now I'm going to start kind of wrapping things up. <clears throat> During this series about life in the kingdom, we've spoken about how the kingdom is good news. And Jesus is our king. We talked about ruling and reigning with him. We talked about spiritual warfare and and a term that we used, uh, subversive submission that Jesus uh, practiced in his relating to injustice concerning himself. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, our authority in Christ, faith and living by the Spirit. We talked about spiritual gifts and that he has given us the keys to the kingdom bearing fruit, and multiplying by making disciples. And then last week, Amy spoke about a kingdom of honor. Hector spoke a few weeks ago about love being the only true motivation for everything we do as believers. In all we do, love is the only motivation. And so I want to bring in the love chapter as a reminder that loving our neighbor is the fulfillment of God's law. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love. I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, or as some say, love never fails. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And I want to close with this quote here. My friend uh, Bill Dodstrom wrote in his recent blog, he says, there... Place yourself in, in the garden at creation. There in the presence of overwhelming goodness in the garden. And having been warned, we chose the fruit of the one tree leading to death. Now Jesus invites us to the reverse. To choose the one tree, the one on which he was lifted up, leading to life. And to choose, not just once, but over and over again, as the claims of death begin to fade in the coming dawn. 
it seems like it would be an easy decision. But it is not. Lord, have mercy. We daily have to choose to eat of the tree of life. To follow Jesus in his death and to deny the constant urges to choose the easy way or the ways that satisfy our flesh. With Jesus, we choose the way of servanthood, the way of suffering, the way of freedom, the way of love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You have done all of this for us. And we haven't even begun to fully comprehend all that you have done for us. But we know that it is good. And you are good. And help us to do that daily choosing that that Bill talks about. Choosing to live according to the tree of life, to choose the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Especially, certainly in our own lives, so we need to own it first. But help us to own it in a way that we're able to give it away. And and I, I... Think about that quote from Larry Crabb, recognizing that there is something terrific in another, and that something terrifically alive in us, if we could only touch that, good things happen. So thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.